Thanks, Jess. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're continuing on our series uh, of um, sermons on life's challenges. And the particular um, topic I'd be covering today is um, on addiction. Specifically, how do we escape from addictions with God-centered willpower? So let us pray before we start. Oh, our God, you are a faithful God. And although sometimes we don't know it, and sometimes even if we are faithless, you remain faithful, for you can't deny yourself. You are faithful and true. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. And you are never changing, despite our um, often changing hearts, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your steadfastness, your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, my name is Jin, and I'm an addict. Today, I preach to you, addict to addict. Or should I say, recovering addict to recovering addict. I couldn't believe it, it's Facebook. Um, you know, um, I found that at work, when I feel a bit sort of tired, or I sort of get, come across a problem that's a bit hard to solve, I sort of want to rest. And the way I rest is to go to Facebook. <laughs> Problem with Facebook is when I say I'm going to go for one minute, one minute becomes five minutes, five minutes become 10 minutes, and for half an hour I've been surfing on Facebook, flicking this eternal flicking thing that keeps going, and I find myself lost in Facebook. In fact, it got so bad that I had to move Facebook out of my home screen on my phone. It is that bad. So Facebook is no longer on my home screen. <laughs> is hidden somewhere where I, when I want Facebook, I'll have to go to it. Now, it may not seem so serious about this. This addiction doesn't sound that serious, is it? But the problem with addiction is that um, it works pretty much exactly the same way as if I'm addicted to real hard drugs. Addiction works in the same cycle throughout. If you look at the medical profession, this is what they're saying. There are five stages to addiction and how it works in our lives. So the first, obviously, is experimentation. It's about exposing ourselves to something. And nothing wrong in that, especially if something is good. We're not talking about drugs here. It could be something really simple like even Bible reading um, or even making friendships, or serving in church, things like that. So experimentation is essentially exposure. So this is like, I've got my login to Facebook, and now I'm on Facebook, and I start using it. So that's okay. Second stage is the keep going stage. It's that part where I start adopting it a little bit into my life. It's like every time I take a break, I look at Facebook. That's a bit of adoption. Maybe it's my break away. I spend five minutes each time, like I said, initially. So making friends, connecting with old friends. So we keep going. Again, nothing that serious about it. Then the third stage is what we call the don't stop stage. This is the part where it starts to get a bit risky, where I say I will go on it for five minutes and I end up spending half an hour on it. So I start to compromise on what I say I will do. The fourth stage it starts to get serious. This is where I call it the you need this stage. You need Facebook. Um, in medical terms, this is called the tolerance stage or the dependency stage. Now, this tolerance and dependency stage is, um, it means that our brains are starting to rewire itself to a point where, where we are starting to go, we can't really do without it. I can't really do without it. I need, I need to go to Facebook at least 20 times a day kind of thing, or every five minutes I gotta go on, just checking what's happened. How many likes have I got, you know, on that article I just posted, you know? Oh, 500, yes! You know? So this is, you, you need this stage. So dependency. So your brains have been rewired, our brains have been rewired to think a certain way. And lastly, the actual addiction stage. This is where we have lost all control. This is where I neglect my family duties, I neglect church um, duties, I neglect um, my fatherly duties, I neglect work on account of Facebook, for example. Now, then there is the relapse, 
Relapse and addiction, similar thing. People who have been addicted to something will have a high chance of relapse. So about 85% of uh, people who were on drugs relapsed within the first year. And 70% of people who have uh, addiction to alcohol um, uh, will relapse at least once in their lifetime. This is from Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why in Alcoholics Anonymous, they don't call people recovered addicts. It's always recovering addicts because an addict will always have a chance of relapsing into the habit because the brains have been rewired. The real problem is the road to addiction is really unpredictable. I gave you five steps. It doesn't quite work that way. For example, we go on Facebook, we go on Instagram, TikTok, whatever that may be, YouTube. The purpose, very clearly, if you talk to a developer from Facebook or, or, or all these um, social media places, they'll tell you their purpose is programmed to keep you as long as possible on Facebook so that you keep flicking. That's their purpose, one single purpose. If they can keep you there for even five seconds more, it's success. And what's happening is, every time we use any of these, remember, I'm not saying it's wrong, but remember, your brains are being rewired. Rewired by the programming that's coming through from Facebook. So, it happens quite subconsciously or unconsciously. The other thing is, take, take porn, for example. Where, which stage do you start with porn? I remember... 40 years ago, that's four decades ago almost, I walked into someone watching porn. I can remember that day like it was yesterday. 40 years, okay? I can't remember the image very clearly, but I can tell you, what stage did I start? Tell me. I think I started on stage four, <laughs> not stage one, right? So the impact of that exposure depends on what that thing is and how strong it grabs you up front and, and, and latches onto your head. And so, you know, um, that's another problem with addiction. And the last thing is, with addiction, we can be addicted to good things. We're not just talking about bad things here. And, and if you wonder if that's true, well, look around the world. Why do we see prominent worship leaders suddenly stepping down and going, I don't believe in God anymore. I quit. Uh, or, or churches uh, where, where, where the pastor falls from grace, prominent pastors. Why? Because the addiction has shifted, uh, ha has caused them to turn away from God and to something else. God was no longer the all in all for them. Something else took over, something demonic. That's the thing about addiction. So going back to these stages, um, what is the core problem with addiction? Well, um, the core problem is, is, is ties to um, temptation. So temptation in, in Greek, the word is pirasmos. Pirasmos means that the, the actual meaning of it is to trial, to experiment, to, to give it a go. So that's temptation by definition. And so the problem with addiction is temptation itself. When we are addicted, it is very hard. Yes, we can fight it, but it is at a level that is so deep and our brains are so rewired, it is very hard to fight your own brains. Your brains, our brains, my brain can trick me into things that I can't even understand. That's the problem. So what I'm saying here is that to fight addiction, We've got to face our temptations. And that's what I want to talk about mainly today. Look at that. Even my phone is buzzing while I'm preaching in the middle. I must turn it off. <laughs> Terrible, isn't it? Okay, so what's the problem? The problem with addiction is temptation. But the problem with temptation is us. We are the problem. The problem with us is, when it comes to temptation, is three things. One, we believe in ourselves. We really do. We think we're great, we, we will be overcoming it, no problem. Secondly, we are all recovering addicts. I know it's not comfortable to hear, I know I'm a recovering addict, I know all of us are, 
but um, we'll talk about that a bit later. And lastly, we yearn to be free of God. We want to be free of God, and we'll talk about that as well. So Charles Hodge says this, uh, false security as to our power to resist temptation rests on an overweening self-confidence in our own strength. So we, what he's saying is that we are so confident in our own strength to withstand anything that that's our problem with temptation. It is when we think we are strongest, we fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, which we just read, says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. This warning is a really important warning because it reminds us that the stronger we are, think we are, the, that's, the, that's the point. That's the point where we are likely to fall. A lot of addicts, when you talk to them in at advanced stages, a lot of them say, I can handle it. I can do it. Ah, no problem. It's just one more drink. It's not a problem. I haven't, I haven't drank for 20 years. One more drink. What is one more drink? It's okay. The second problem is we are recover, all recovering addicts. Gerald May, who's um, a, a doctor who's de- been dealing with addiction and grace um, uh, as a Christian doctor for many, many years, he said this, to be alive is to be addicted. And to be alive and addicted is to stand in need of grace. And again, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13a, the first part says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. What's it telling us? It's telling us that all of us are going to be tempted because of who we are. We talked about that just now, right? Um, um, We are tempted by porn because we are all adulterers, even though we have not committed our adultery. We are tempted by by um, theft, we're tempted to steal because we are all thieves, even though we do not steal. We are tempted to kill. We're tempted to kill because we are murderers, even though we do not slay our brother or sister. This, this is a paraphrase from Helmut Thielic, um, one of the great theologians, um, And I think there's something really true about this. If we think about it, why are we tempted? We're tempted because of who we are, by very nature. It's not comfortable, but it's the real truth about ourselves. But 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 to 11 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were all I was one of them. We were that. We were murderers. We were thieves. We were adulterers. But Christ has come for those of us who have been saved by the blood of Christ. That is our old self. That's the flesh. That is the thing that's fighting us all the time. Our new identity is in Christ. And that's why we have this raging battle for the rest of our lives until we are glorified in Christ when we see Him. And the third problem, as I said, was we yearn to be free of God. As I mentioned, Helmut Thielic in his book, uh, Between God and Satan, which he talks about Jesus' temptation um, uh, and how Jesus did not fall um, and how in that process of being tempted, He became our brothers. He knew what we're going through and He fights for us today. So he says this, the wish to be free of God is the deepest yearning of man. It is greater than his yearning for God. In 
in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, B, right, it says, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. But if you think about it, this verse, when I first read it, it didn't resonate very much. It didn't like, it almost like, well, is it, does it really ring true? Eh, I don't know. And I, I wonder why I thought that way. And I, and I, I realized that actually the problem is sometimes we actually do not want to use our ability to battle temptation. Sometimes we do not want to take the way of escape even if it was in front of our face. That's why we want to be free from God. Would you imagine God sitting next to you when we're uh, watching porn? I think that's pretty embarrassing, is it not? So with that, I, don't, I, I think we've come to the point to realize how helpless we are against our old self. If we try willpower alone, it's not going to go very far, is it? So our great escape from addiction consists of two parts, and these two parts must be in play or we will not be escaping addiction or temptation. And the two parts are the existence of grace, and existing, the existence, existence of will. The need for grace and will, both must be present. Let's talk about grace. Revisiting 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, God is faithful. That's grace. God is faithful to us. And He will not let, right? Those are the key words you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is God. This is His grace offered to us who have Him as our Lord and Saviour. The word um, faithful uh, in Greek uh, is uh, translated as uh, pistos. And pistos basically means um, someone who is trustworthy in the transaction of business, the execution of commands, or the discharge of official duties. That is what faithful means when it comes to God. That, so God is trustworthy in the transaction of business. He is trustworthy in the execution of His commands. And He is trustworthy in the discharge of his official duties as your God and my God. Okay, just a quick exercise. i give you 15 seconds, all right? Think of the three most faithful people you can think of. Faithful and true and loyal. It doesn't need to be real people. It could be people in the past. It could be people in a character, uh, a character in a show or something. I'll give you 15 seconds and just think about who are the top three most faithful people in your head? Just think about it in your head, all right? I'll take you 15 seconds. Just think about it. Okay. When I gave myself this exercise, it was quite hard to come up with any names, but it took me a while, so it wasn't, it wasn't very fair of me to give you just 15 seconds. These were the three I thought of. Funny Lucas mentioned the Queen today. Uh, queen Elizabeth II, uh, who has been serving as the Queen, serving really, really devotedly to her country, 70 years. Mother Teresa, who has been serving the poor for all her life until, the, until she died. And Samwise Gamgee from Lord of the Rings, of course. I mean, if it wasn't for Samwise, Frodo would never have survived, right? <laughs> He's the real hero. Um, so, these are three faithful people. Can I have a show of hands? How many of us thought of Jesus Christ as faithful? Just, just 
that's awesome. You guys are better than me. <laughs> I did not think about Jesus. And I was so devastated to realize that I did not think about Jesus that way, that He is faithful. Yet in Revelation 19 verse 11, what does it tell us? It tells us that Jesus is the rider on the white horse whose name is faithful and true. Jesus is not just a faithful and true Savior. He is faithful. He is true. You know, the world talks about Jesus is love, God is love, and all these things. They don't even mean it. Um, but how about God is faithful? God is true. It's a bit of rebuke to me, you know. Um, I didn't think about Jesus. How could I? And I think it's because we've been conditioned to think that Jesus came to die for our sins and then He's gone again. That's the problem. And I thought, I need to fix that perception of Jesus. Jesus is sitting up there in the right hand of God right now for all of us who have believed in Him right now. He's intervening for you right now. The enemy is going, look at them, look at them, look at them. They've done all this, they've done all this. Look at them. Look, 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 look. All your people are useless. They are falling into temptation all again and again. What, what's the point of these people? But no, Jesus is there saying that I have died for these people. Satan has no hold on these people. Whoever you gave to me, Father, never, never slips out of my hand. Isn't that awesome? God is faithful and true. I think when we think about Jesus loves us, I think we, let's think about us as His beloved. In Romans 9 verse 25, it says this, As indeed, he says in Hosea, Those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. You who have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are God's beloved. Remember that. Okay, that cannot be taken away from you, even if you were faithless. In a sense, in a moment of faithlessness, that has never taken, uh, cannot be taken away from you if you are saved by the blood of Christ. So going through temptation is like a whole, going, putting your boat, sailing your boat out to stormy seas and it gets really uncontrollable. Addiction and temptation is very hard to battle. We know that. Now, the question is, is Jesus on the boat when you went out to sail? Can you imagine the, the disciples who, who went out to sea um, and, and, and then the waves came and crashed about and they were trying to, to, to weather the storm and then they said, oh, oh, uh, we need help. We're going to die here. Go downstairs and, and wake, wake whatever up that, that, that you brought and, you, and the disciples went there and, and they opened the, the, the cabin and said, hey, where's Jesus? Oh no, it's an idol that's with us. Who This thing is not going to save us. Imagine that. So the question is, the most important question is, for grace to be in our lives, is Jesus in our lives? Is Jesus our captain of our boat? So that's grace. But what about will? Again, let's reread 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. The will is all you. It's all me. It's our will power, so to speak. You know, it's funny sometimes as Christians, we look at something like that and say, ah, nah, God will take away that temptation from me. Ah, God will take away the trials from me. That, that's what that verse says, Right? I mean, is it? Is, it, is that how Christian, Christianity is all about? Is that what Jesus comes down, saves us, and He's gone kind of thing? It's not, is it? It's a really funny title from this book by um, Drew Dyke. His book um, called Your Future Self Will Thank You. Uh, Secrets to Self-Control from the Bible and Brain Science. And in chapter 7, he named it, Grace Means I Don't Need Self-Control and other dumb things Christians think. I mean, it's dumb Christianity. 
It's dumb to think that we don't have to exert our willpower. We certainly have to. We have a part to play. Yes, by the grace of God, we are saved. But when we live our lives under the grace of God, we have to exert our willpower under the grace of God, under the will of God. So back to this boat. Imagine, yes, Jesus was in the boat, and the disciples would wave, were trying to control the boat so that the storm doesn't kill them, and, and they keep doing that. Jesus is still sleeping in the boat, and it's still crashing around. Jesus is still sleeping in the boat. <laughs> Not much of a story, is it? No, but what did they do? They made a choice to wake Jesus up, went down. Jesus! Do you care that we die here? Jesus, wake up. Come on, save us. We know that you can save us. And Jesus went out, rebuked the wind, calmed the storm and said, where's your faith? What happened to your faith, ye of little faith? What happened to it? Jesus was still their Lord, but he did rebuke them. The question is, those of us who are Christians, we have Jesus in our boat. Are we waking Jesus up when, we're, when the storms are coming? Do we remember to go to Jesus when the storms are hitting us? How does it come together? Sort of like this diagram. Um, our will alone is not going to do anything because we know that we're going to relapse. We're going to fall in again and again and we're going to have no reason once we have overcome to continue. His grace alone is not enough because we might want to continue with sin. So our will has to be bowed down to do the will of God. So it is your will in God's grace. Again, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. This is how it comes together. God's grace. God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond that's your will, your ability. But with the temptation, God's grace, He will also provide the way of escape that your will, you may be able to endure it. Do you see how this is coming together? To battle temptation so that we don't fall into addiction and to sometimes overcome addiction, we need God's grace. Under God's grace, we exert our willpower everything we can. Ligonia Ministries, um, uh, where uh, R.C. Sproul was part of um, before he passed away, um, he says this, God's method of sanctification is neither activism, which is self-reliant activity, nor apathy, which is a God-reliant passivity. Rather, it's but human effort, your will, dependent on God, God's grace. You see that coming together in your life? Again, back to Charles Hodge. He says, the absolute security of believers and the necessity of constant watchfulness are perfectly consistent. This is the Christian life. This is your life in Christ. Okay, you might think, ah, what's the application? That sounds like theory. I hope you don't think it's all theory because that, until we believe that, we're not going to apply it. Or it's going to be hard to apply. In terms of application of your will and God's grace, remember Jessica read to us earlier on, Judges, um, it's all about how the Israelites keep going in this crazy cycle of addiction to idolatry, constantly turning away from God. Turn away from God, they get oppressed, they get taken over by some horrible country, and then they turn to God, beg for help. God sends them a judge, saves them, they have peace for 20, 40 years, and then they go round the cycle again and they worship something else, and idolatry again, they keep turning away from God. Why is that recorded in the Bible? It is recorded to warn us, to warn us to flee from idolatry. We are 
prone to idolatry. I am prone to idolatry. Any second I lose um, my sight on God, I start treasuring something else. If there's no God in my center, it'll be something else. In terms of application, the 14th verse covers it really well. Therefore, my beloved, God's grace, flee from idolatry, your will. That is the application. No three-step process, no five-step process. Therefore, my beloved, knowing that you belong to God, you are new in Christ, flee from idolatry, your old self. Flee from your flesh. And as God's people, we have a part to play with each other. That's the purpose of the church. That's why we come to church, to edify and to glorify God, to work each other up into uh, a loving unity in the Spirit. Finally, I'll leave you with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. The grace of God, since we have these promises, beloved, that's the grace of God, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. That's our willpower under the grace of God. Bringing holiness to complete completion in the fear of God. I'd like to read something to you quickly from Charles Hodge. He explains will under grace very well. He says this, He has promised that those given to the Son as His inheritance should never perish. They are kept, therefore, by the power of God through faith unto salvation. This promise of security, however, which is talking about this thing we, talk, we just read about today, is a promise of security from sin. And therefore, those who fall into willful and habitual sin are not the subjects of this promise in 10, uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Should they fall, it is after a severe struggle and they are soon renewed again unto repentance. The absolute security of believers and the necessity of constant watchfulness are perfectly consistent. We've just read that. The grace of God across us, we exert our will under the grace of God. We get forgiveness under the grace of God. We have, God picks us up again and again, but He will pick us up after a severe struggle. We will struggle, but God will pick us up. So let us uh, know, remember that as beloved of Christ, Flee from idolatry. In closing, let us sing this song. Um, Jesus, Lamb of God, you are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Let us stand for this song.